You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. A Soldier's Imitation of Mary by Mary Kate Ellis, read by Hannah Patrizzi. Saint Joan of Arc. She was a mystic, a soldier, a peasant. Inspired by the Holy Ghost, she stood, fought, and died for her home, country, and king. An illustration of charity, generosity, bravery, and purity. She was pushed by the Holy Ghost into the field of battle to fulfill what God's will was for her in her life. However, as holy as she was in life, her story has been taken by the secular world, twisted into a false narrative of feminism and other outrageous modern ideas, as they try to insinuate that our pure saint was truly just a confused girl that wanted to be a man and fight in a war. It is in times like this that we need a champion like the Holy Maid of Orléans, who imitated the Blessed Virgin as closely as she could. This peasant girl was well-loved in the little village of Dolmémy, France. She was noted as being the shepherdess of her father's flocks, though quit this job in order to help her mother in the house. It was in this little home that her parents inspired her with the love of God. Though she could not read or write, she could pray the rosary and the Lord's Prayer and she attended Mass as often as she could. She received her first vision at the same age as Our Lady, when St. Gabriel the Archangel came to her. Except St. Joan saw a different angel wreathed in light. In the little forest around Dolmémy, she saw the Archangel St. Michael, who appeared to her with a heavenly mission. He informed this little peasant girl that she was to deliver France from her enemy, English. Joan's response? We would assume holy fear, trembling, and disbelief, a declaration of unworthiness. Rather, she calmly replied with, How will this be done? St. Michael's answer was sufficient for her, as he said, It is God that commands this. St. Joan was 13. She could not use a sword or ride a horse, she could not read or write, and she certainly did not know any important people. But she, of all people, was meant to find the crown prince and see him crowned the king? She did not let this distress her. Rather, she drew back to the holy archangel's answer to her, and she carried on patiently with her simple life, and she advanced in her mission. The archangel and Saints Catherine of Alexandria and Margaret of Antioch urged her along in the next several years. Soon, all of Dolmémy knew of this, quote, foolish mission and the well-loved Joan was shied away from. It was her aunt, her father's sister, who believed in the sincerity of Joan's words and actions that convinced her uncle to take Joan on a trip with him, where they would be close to a French military base. It was here that Joan asked day after day to see the Sieur Robert de Bourricourt, a great French military commander, and it was here that her persistence and prayers won a first small victory. Jean de Metz, a rather gentle but coy squire of Boudricourt's, happened upon Joan as he was entering the military base one day. He turned toward her and he asked her, Who is your lord, madam? Joan replied, God. The knight was struck by the simplicity and childlike sweetness of her answer, as he had been asking for the name of the governor of her town. He proceeded to persuade Boudricourt to help her reach the crown prince and became her personal escort to Chino, where the prince was hiding. It was he that saw her all the way to Chino, where she was, again, put to the test. In a room filled with French nobility, she was parted from Demet, and she was asked to locate the prince in the crowded room. She had never seen her prince before, nor had anyone described him to her. It was with God's help that she was guided through the room and immediately pointed out her meek and hiding Dauphin. She was there to see her beloved king crowned, was examined with great patience by the royal court and the learned priest of Chinon, and was, in the end, sent out to end the war. She met her trials and pain with patience, was known for casting out filth from her camps, and oftentimes intended mass as many times a day as she could. Her military victories were known to be miraculous, and she was said to have been filled with a childlike outlook and innocence even though she bore incredible tactical knowledge. She won battle after battle, 
and she had a multitude of letters penned in order to negotiate with the English, though most of these negotiations were not well received. She was captured by the English in Compiègne in 1430, May 23rd. She was moved to Bouillon and then to Brohevois, where she attempted to jump out of her 60-foot tower and attempt to take her own life. This child, keep in mind that she was still a child of 19 years, was terrified of fire and had heard that the English would kill prisoners by burning them. After she jumped, she sustained only small injuries. She had been saved by God because her work was not yet complete. After this, she was taken to Rouen for her first trial. It is in the manuscripts that we can truly see the childlike Joan take her stand. Her answers were simple and truthful. Though there is a childlike tone to some of her answers, others are quite wise and very mature. When asked if she was in God's grace, she sagely replied, If I am not, God put me there. If I am, God keep me there. I should be the saddest creature in the world if I knew I were not in God's grace. I think if I were in sin, the voices would not come to me, and I wish everyone heard it as I do. Threatened with fire, she became frightened and abjured her voices and divine mission, but again prayed and revoked the abjuration. It was this final revocation that earned her a place at the stake. She was tied to the stake, given a small cross made of sticks, and died crying out to the holy name of Jesus. Seeing as this saint is a soldier, a warrior, it can be difficult to see how she so sweetly imitated Our Lady. From the very first moment that St. Michael came to her, she desired to consecrate her virginity to God. She was always modest and reserved, always quietly at her ease. She had incredible interior insight, able to easily discern what God's will was for her. She was pious, putting God first, the church, then her family and her homeland. Her one true love was God. Her heart longed for him, as did Our Lady's. Heaven was her reward, and she knew it to be the resting place which she thirsted for. In her purity, her meekness, her long-suffering and self-forgetfulness, we can look upon the starling French saint and see her virtues like a bouquet of lilies sitting before the altar. Her life was dedicated to him and to his cause and to his plans for her. Along with St. Joan, along with our Blessed Mother, we must pray for forgetfulness of our own wills, for a greater love of God, and for trust in God's will for us and say, Fiat Voluntas Tua.